Okay, praise the Lord. Well, we want to welcome our internet audience tonight joining us. This is uh, Wednesday, April the 13th, 2016. And we have been studying on Wednesday nights the book of Acts. And a reminder again, it's called Acts because it's about what the actors were doing. Well, the apostles, the, the disciples of Jesus were do doing uh, shortly after uh, the Lord was received up into heaven. And it's exciting to consider all that was happening at that time. And it's exciting to consider that the Lord is coming back again soon. And he expect, uh, expects us to be acting like we read here. Amen? Amen. And so tonight we're in chapter number... 13. And so let's start reading uh, in just a moment. Father, we uh, reverence your word. We are reminded that you've even exalted your word above your name. And so tonight we thank you that we can worship the word because Jesus is the word. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. We declare we have ears to hear. And because we hear, faith comes. And Lord, faith pleases you. We desire to have strong faith. So the more word in us equals more stronger faith. So we thank you for strong faith tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now remember we were in Antioch and that was the place that uh, the believers were first referred to as Christians. And it says in uh, verse 1 of chapter 13, Now there were in the church uh, at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. So there were what? Prophets and teachers. What's a prophet? Can someone tell me what a, what a prophet is? I'll put you to work today. What's a prophet? Who was a prophet? Yeah, brother. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, praise God. So, so we're referring to the prophet as described uh, in uh, in Scripture about the fivefold ministry, right? Prophet. The actually the first listed is the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher in the book of Ephesians, and and the word tells us that Jesus gave these gifts, these five ministries, to cause the church to grow, to mature. To where the church, the rest of the members, will do the work of the ministry. Um, it's, it's important to consider that Jesus didn't declare in his word that the fivefold ministry is to do the work of the ministry. It's the body of Christ that is to, to do the work of the ministry. The job of the fivefold ministry is to equip and train us. To do the work okay and unfortunately this is backwards in so many places because people have the thinking well I pay I pay the preacher to do my praying for me to do my studying for me to do the outreach that's what I pay the preacher to do and I show, show up on Sunday morning or whenever I feel like it and I'll give my money see that's not what the plan of God is the plan of God is for for that fivefold ministry to, to anoint and empower the body to continue the work of Jesus. And we learned in, in just a few chapters ago that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. That was, he, that's what he did. He went around and set people free that were bound by the devil. So that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing. Amen. So, it's described here that there were, uh, there, was, there were certain prophets, so there was more than one prophet. Again, a prophet is someone that speaks inspired words, prophetic utterances. Now, some people think that a prophet is one that can foretell the future. Well, at times, a prophet can give a word of wisdom dealing with future events, or a word of knowledge dealing with present or past events. 
but, but primarily a prophet brings uh, divine utterances in a language we can understand. And it's, it's uh, uh, an anointing that my experience is it helps activate callings and anointings in other people's lives. When you get under the prophetic anointing, it will challenge and it will activate anointings and callings. And so there were prophets and teachers. Now, what is a teacher? Again, that is part of the fivefold ministry. A teacher is someone that God specially anoints with a teaching ability to get things across that people can grasp and put to work in their lives. We need teaching. Hello. Do you know that Jesus, he was wrapped up all fivefold ministries in, in, his, in his time here on this earth. He, he did all of them. But I believe he worked more, at, more time at teaching than any other. Because we need to learn. We need to be taught. Hallelujah. Praise God for the apostle who has an overarching uh, bringing order and so forth. Praise God for an apostle. Apostle is one that establishes churches and works. Again, we talked about the prophet. Praise God for that. Uh, apostle, prophet, uh, uh, evangelist. Evangelist is someone that's anointed to, to not just um, um, preach loud. No, someone is an evangelist that they have an anointing to get people saved. It's just something about you know what what they minister how they minister how god uses them is that people get saved under their ministry praise god many times it's um you know in special meetings outside the church um uh but an, an evangelist is a is a, a great a great anointing we need that in the church otherwise not too many people will get saved hallelujah well the pastor what's the pastor pastor's the local shepherd to watch over the, sh- the, the, the flock, to care um, for the local, local ministry and minister what, what goes on in the local house. And then, of course, the, uh, the teacher here is the one that, that has that great anointing to teach. And so there were prophets and teachers there. And it says Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and, and Manaen which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So here's the listing of the people that were there. And so they operated these in uh, prophetic ministry and teaching ministry. And also I did fail to mention that it's, it's not unusual. In fact, it's very common for these two ministry gifts to work together in the person. Okay. And, and by the way, I'm one that believes God uses women in ministry gifts as well, not just men. All right? The Bible talks about Anna, the prophetess that, that held Jesus when he was a baby. And, and there are whole groups and denominations that, that supposedly disqualify women because, uh, you know, what Paul writes and they don't understand what he's writing in, in the other letters. And so they say, well, women can't be, you know, can't be fivefold ministry. Well, they have a problem with the Bible because the Bible's full of uh, prophets and teachers and so forth that, uh, uh, that were women. Now, I'm, I'm, I'll give my personal opinion. My personal opinion regarding the pastoral role is that that's probably not the best thing for a, to, a woman to step into. Uh, now, they do, and they can do a great job. God can use them. But I believe it's best for a man to be uh, the shepherd, the head shepherd over a flock. That's, that's just my experience in, in working with the calling and dealing with the people and so forth. Uh, but again, God, God can use women in those roles. Usually, a woman has to step up because a man's not taking his place in that, in that role. Praise God. Okay, so they were all gathered together in, in this place, and it says they ministered to the Lord. Can someone help me? What does that mean, ministering to the Lord? What is it? Praising Him? Okay. What did you say? Expressing adoration to God? 
ministering to the Lord. Anybody else? What does it mean to you? Yes, def- definitely, definitely is is spiritual ministry. Well, the Lord is a spirit, so if we're going to minister to Him, we have to minister Him to Him in the spirit. Hallelujah. What does it mean to minister? If if you were to minister to someone, what does that mean? Serving them. It means you're. You're doing what they want to do, not what you want to do. Is, is that a good way to put that? I, I know that's backwards of so many people because <laughs> they're most concerned about what can you do for me. Hallelujah. But it says here they were ministering to the Lord, but also with their ministering to the Lord, they were fasting. I'll say that a little louder. They were fasting. They were fasting and ministering to the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, sister. So, uh, is that like ushers? You know how they, they minister in the church to, um, to help people that? Well, that's, uh, that's an example of ministering, yes. Ushers are are in a church environment to, to help keep order in the church, to help with seating, to help, you know, minister to receive the tithes and offerings and, and uh, communion and all those things. That's, that's a serving. Well, think of then, we are serving, ministering to the Lord, we are serving Him. How do we do that? That's a good way is, is yes, praying in the Spirit and, and singing and praising Him. Testifying of his goodness, yes. All all of those things are are ministering to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Meditating on the Lord. If you're meditating on the Lord, you're meditating on his word. That's true. All right. So these are some examples of 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 really what they were doing. And they were putting their flesh down so they could be more spiritually attuned as they were ministering to the Lord. Now, I have to tell you something. This is something that has uh, been a lost art for many Christians. We don't take the time to minister to the Lord. We don't take the time like we should to fast, to put this body down. Uh, the two go together. I mean, you can go without food, and all you'll end up with is just a, a headache or getting hungry. But no, when you're fasting and then you're spending that time with the Lord, ministering unto Him, praying and seeking His face, seeking His, his wisdom and His word in, in your life, then things will start to happen. You'll start hearing from God. And in this particular instance, they heard from God. Why were they ministering to the Lord and fasting? Because they needed to hear. Because there were great persecutions and things happening and open doors of ministry and all kinds of things are going on and they needed the direction of the Lord you know it's not unlike today my friends we need the direction from God we need words from heaven praise the Lord and so as they ministered what happened the Holy Ghost spoke see we want we want the Holy Ghost to speak Without ministering to the Lord. Again, it it ties into what I said earlier about the attitude, well, we want to reap before we sow. No, this is the only, if we want to hear from heaven, if we want clear direction from God, if we want doors to open for us, then we're going to have to start spending more time ministering to the Lord instead of ministering to our flesh. Hallelujah. Yeah, brother. It's exactly true. It's right. It is. Yes. Either we're feeding the flesh or feeding the spirit. By feeding the spirit, you're, you're telling the flesh no. <clears throat> so what did the Holy Ghost say? Well, that's not him right there. I can tell you that. <laughs> Praise God. What did the Holy Ghost say? He said, separate me. Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. 
Wow. Now just think, if they hadn't been fasting, if they hadn't been ministering to the Lord, perhaps Paul and Barnabas, or Saul, we call him Saul here, Saul and Barnabas wouldn't have gone to do what God wanted them to do. What God wanted them, what, what God wanted them to do. Think about that. Wow. They, they could have missed some divine appointments. Some people could have not been saved because they didn't take the time to hear from heaven to be where God wanted them to be. Yeah. Important. It's important that we hear from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in return, the Holy Spirit rewarded them because of their obedience. Amen. That's right. And so, so they were able to respond to the call of God because they were ministering unto the Lord. And it says in verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed, so apparently they fasted and prayed some more. They fasted and prayed some more. And they laid their hands on them, and sent them off. They were sent out. Praise God. So if you think of it this way is. They were prophets and teachers ministering to the Lord. They were sent out then. Not only in those ministry gifts. But an apostle is one sent. So they went off also with an apostle's anointing. From this, from this prayer meeting. And it says, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they weren't sent by these men, they were sent by God. God had an appointment, God had a plan, and they heard from God and they went on the plan of God. So they were sent. And they departed to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And then they were at Salamis. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John with them as their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, who was named, it says Bar-Jesus. What, what that means is the, the son of Joshua or Yeshua. And he was with the deputy of the country, who was Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. God had a plan, and it was to reach the highest deputy in the country. Wow. Sounds like an important assignment to me. And so this, minister, this, this deputy of the country called for Barnabas and Saul. But this sorcerer, his name was Elimus, he withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. He, he, was, he was Jewish by descent, but he was using sorcery and control over people. And Saul who is also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Ghost. Ooh, you know why they were filled with the Holy Ghost? Because they had fasted, prayed, and ministered to the Lord. He was full of the Holy Ghost, and he set his eyes on this sorcerer guy, and he said, listen to this, O oh, full of all subtlety and mischief, you child of the devil. <laughs> you enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You know, the hand of the Lord upon someone can be a blessing, but it also can be a hand of judgment. And the hand of the Lord is upon thee, Paul said, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately, say immediately. immediately. 
And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. I mean, this is the true power of God. You know, uh, we, we were with Brian Besser um, and his, his family, you know, this weekend, and he shared a story uh, of something that happened. They were, they were at a, a church, and, and there was worship going on, and it just was a great presence of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, on the stage area, there rose this mist like a, like a cloud started growing up. And he said, oh, man, I see it. I see the glory of God. And, and then after the service, he asked some other, did you see that? Yeah, yeah, we saw it. Hallelujah. And later on, he, he, he actually talked to the pastor. He said, man, that was a great service. And, and uh, oh, man, I saw the glory. I saw the glory. And the pastor started laughing. He thought, why is the pastor laughing? Well, the pastor said, well, someone accidentally touched the button and the, and the smoke machine came on. You see, there's a real and there's a fake. We want to see the real. There is a real presence of God that time will be like a cloud. The Bible talks about it. It's a real thing. But a lot of places are trying to manufacture it. This was real. The power of God was present. The anointing on Paul was so strong that this one that was, was trying to prevent what they came to do he spoke judgment against him, and the man was stricken immediately blind. Now, according to Scripture, it didn't last forever. And I believe he had a chance to repent of what he was doing. You know, you have something like that happen to you, it is a good opportunity to repent. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. But it says in verse 12, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, when he saw the power of God... He believed, being ex uh, he was exto uh, astonished at the doctrine of the Lord and the demonstration of the Spirit. Praise God. So this head of the country got saved. Amen. Hallelujah. So when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Parmaphilia, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. So when they departed Perga, they came to Antioch. Uh, they came back to Antioch and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down, and after reading of the law, the prophets, the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they got an open invitation to, to teach at the synagogue after the reading of the Torah. So Paul stood up, and he beckoned with his hands, and he said this. And I'm, I'm going to just read this until the end here. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high hand he brought them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years until Samuel the prophet... And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of uh, Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he testi uh, gave testimony, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now what is he doing? He is teaching Jews. And he's sharing the story of 
the family. The Jewish group, it's a family. Started by God with Abraham. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's keep reading. Verse 23, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So here, right now, he's inserting what they know from the Word of God about speaking about David and that God would cause his throne, his kingdom to last forever. And so they understood that the Messiah would come through David's lineage And so he's declaring right now, this Messiah is Jesus. Then he jumps to John, the Baptist. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose." Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and so whoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So he's telling them, this word is for you. This word is for you. Verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew not him, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But, say but, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And of course we know. And we read it already in the book of Acts. That in between that, that 40 days, between his, his resurrection and his ascension, he appeared to the disciples numerous times. And one particular time, he revealed himself to over 500 people at one time. That's a lot of witnesses. And you could not not tell that it was Jesus. He just hold up his hands. You look at his feet. You look on the score, the scars around him from those thorns, that crown of thorns that was put on him. There was no doubt this was Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. What verse? I got, I got lost here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. And when he has seen many days of them which came up from him in Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people, and we declare unto you glad tidings. That means good news. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Praise the Lord. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his... See, he's still preaching. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on asleep and was laid unto his father and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe, all that believe are justified. Not just a certain group. All that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he's telling them that the law of Moses is not enough. Mankind needs a Savior. And the Savior is not just the first five books of the Bible. 
Praise God for the Torah. Praise God for it. But Jesus came to bring a new and living way. Praise the Lord. Beware, therefore, lest that that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and those that wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You know, for the, for the Jew, it's like a veil is over their eyes, like a curtain. And they have to really seek and press in for that veil to be removed. It's not impo- impossible for a Jew to get saved. It's not. But they have, they have to really press in because of the traditions and all of the religious things that they have in the way. It, it, can, it can cause them... To reject Jesus. Well, and of course, the, another excuse they use, well, you know, it's the Christians that killed so many Jews and brought such persecution against the Jews. Well, it, that was not real Christians that did that in history. A real Christian doesn't kill people. No, that's, that's but, but they were, you know, some of the crusaders, some of that stuff. The, the main crusading that was done was really against the Muslims, not against the Jews, but some, some, yeah, Jews were killed by Christians. So Jews used that as an excuse of, you know, well, I, I don't want to be a Christian or be associated with Jesus because they killed part of our family. Yeah, Dad? Well, uh, when do you think this will happen? I'm sorry? When do you think this will happen? When do I think this will happen? When is he coming? Would we, we all would like to know the exact day, wouldn't we? But we have clues in the Bible of the season and when it will be. And those clues tell us it is very, very soon. Very, very soon. Well, right. Right. But see, there was not as much light on the prophetic things in the Bible pointing to the time. See, did you know that many people thought that Hitler was the Antichrist? That that was a big thing back then. Well, that wasn't right, obviously looking at it now, looking for where we are today. But at the time, if they knew the Bible, they wouldn't even have thought that. Because Israel had to become a nation first. That had to happen. Before the Antichrist could raise up and so forth. So again, as we get closer to the actual time, more and more of Scripture is being opened up that we can see and understand. Now one thing we can know for sure though. Jesus said that when you see Israel become a nation. Read in Matthew, talks about that. When you see that happen, all the things in Scripture will be fulfilled. The generation that sees that happen will see the fulfillment of all these things. So someone that says, well, Jesus, he's not been coming for 50 or 100 years. Well, they don't know Scripture then. So the generation, this Israel became a nation in 1948. That generation that saw that is coming to the end. Also, we see all the alignings of other things, all the nations against against Israel, the enemies surrounding Israel. We've seen in the last five years, ten years, a great change in Iran, which is a country to watch, right? And Russia, ten years ago, Russia uh, was an economic mess 
And now they've turned around and they're again a big powerhouse. And so we can see the lining Russia and Iran are working together. And they're going to be the main nations that come against Israel that talks about in the war of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38. So we're seeing things all set up. We just don't know the exact moment. But you know, it could be any time. It's very, very soon. Praise God. Yes, Maria. That, that is true. Jews are, and Muslims are coming to Jesus in great numbers. And I've heard numerous testimonies of Jesus himself appearing to Muslims and declaring who he is, giving them an opportunity to get saved. Praise the Lord. Amen. So know this. Jesus is going to come on time when the Father sends him. Our main job is to be ready, to be ready. And this, the stage is being set. The stage is being set. So Uh-huh. Uh-huh. what do we tell them? Well, uh, here's here's a good thing I believe to tell them. The Bible talks very specific, specifically about the virgins. They were waiting for the bridegroom. Their five pressed in and stayed ready, but five others started losing hope. And they stop filling their lamps with oil. They stop pressing into the word of God. They stop going to church. And they got discouraged. And, and you know, they're, they're maybe even trying to blame other people for it. But really, their job is to stay ready. That is the job. And that's, that's a real, I believe, uh, uh, picture for you and I to, to stay as wise virgins and not foolish. Another thing I, I'm going to get, I saw some hands go up. I'll get to you in a sec. The, the other point that I want to bring up is in the early church, the early church got real discouraged because the apostles started dying. And they thought, well, maybe, maybe we're not following this. Maybe this isn't true because they were seeing the apostles die. Because why was that? Because they had the wrong understanding that Jesus was going to come back in their generation. They didn't understand a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, as Peter wrote. They didn't understand about the time of the church age. They didn't understand the 4,000 years initial, the 2,000 years of the church, then the 1,000 year millennial reign, the seven day pattern, 7,000 years. They didn't, they didn't have light on it. And so they started getting discouraged and people started falling away. Well, that's happening today. But we must exhort them, hey, this is not the time to fall away or dis get discouraged. You don't want to be, and, and I, I really believe this. I believe there are some people that do know the Lord that will get so lukewarm that when Jesus comes back, they may miss it. They may miss the first load and have to go through part of the tribulation period. And, and what happens it then is, if they want to keep their salvation, they're going to have to reject the mark of the beast and they will have to be beheaded. And that's quite a thing to face. You don't have to have your head cut off if you deny Jesus and take the mark. Some people will deny Jesus. See, and, and you know... Uh, you don't want to be faced with that. <laughs> I'd rather go out of here in glory, amen, than face all of that. Praise God. So, so I, I think the thing is just to exhort them with the scripture of the, of the virgins, the wise, and the foolish. And, and this is not a time to grow, grow weary in doing good. This is not a time to give place to these things. Yes.
15 years. When we think of eternity, it's never going to end. You know, what's another 10 or 15 years before Jesus comes? And, and I, I would be surprised if it's that long, but of course I thought that 20 years ago too. Um, but with the way things are falling into place in the world today, I think it's much shorter than that. Amen. Yeah. I understand what that brother's saying. Uh, a lot of people are saying, well, this has been spoken before. But we want a clear understanding of the times we're living in. Read Matthew 25. All right. We need and, both, huh? And praise God. You see, and it talks about the foolish virgins. They had lamps, but they didn't have extra oil. See, they grieved the Holy Somewhere, somewhere down the line, they grieved the Holy Spirit. See, the Word can't save you just the Word by itself. It has to have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the lamp. It, it, the Holy Spirit is the one that allows you to illuminate with the glory of God. Mm. And since we since the Lord is glorified and he radiates the children of God, they radiate too. So the Lord in the spiritual realm <coughs> is able to recognize those that are his because we radiate. Amen. The glory <laughs> the glory of God See, and, is and upon us. It, when you grieve the Holy Spirit <coughs> Grieve the Holy Spirit, do mm -hmm. not put out the Spirit of fire. Because the Father, Father He radiates with glory. And we, as children of God, we are to radiate too. So when we sin and don't repent, <coughs> the, the light goes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But when we repent and get on the path that God has called us to walk, each and every day we grow brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Till the noonday sun. Amen. Yes, we are getting close to the end of the time. And God is speaking according to his word to the pastors, to the children of Israel. Be awake. Know the times you're living in. Don't grieve the spirit, don't put out the spirit's fire. Amen. Radiate. Amen. Amen. We're gonna we're gonna radiate, brother. All right, brother. Let's go ahead and we'll get ready to close. Go ahead. Time to quit. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I. Uh, <coughs> I want to say something I haven't yet to anybody in church yet. You can calm down. You can get to the end of Jesus. Do you believe? Hey, yes, yes, he does. In fact, the word of God, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's something in me that I don't like to talk about for another night. But there is that in me that I want to get to. But you're saying that Dying, I was shocked. Is that what it is? You're dying on the Lord. Is that what you're saying? 
That's what the scripture says. I, I, be, I believe that. And, amen. I mean, at, at that moment, you're realizing that you're not going to live much longer and you're calling on God to, to help you. And in that moment, you can repent and receive the Lord. You don't have to be baptized in water. You know, it, it, that's, those are all, you know, things that can get religious. No, it says very clearly, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You know, if people, I've heard people dying. They're using the Lord's name, but it's in vain. <coughs> There's a big difference. A big difference being, you know, you know, and dying or, oh, help me, God. Big difference. So I, I believe we can have faith in that scripture that declares that. Amen. Amen. Pray. You know, it's not by our works that we get saved anyway. It's just believing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thanks for sharing tonight. Let's all stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer. You know, we didn't get through this whole chapter. Because there's some wild things that happen in the rest of this chapter. So we will get back to that in two weeks because next week will be Passover. Okay? All right. Father in heaven, we give you praise and glory. Hallelujah. Praise and glory to you for the things that we've heard and the things that we've learned tonight. Father, oh, hallelujah, may we be moved to spend more time ministering to you, ministering to you, fasting and ministering to you so that we can hear more clearly from heaven. Because, Lord, I believe that you have assignments, you have callings on every one of our lives. You have people for us to touch, people for us to share the gospel, people for us to get them into the kingdom of God. And Lord, there's a rippling effect. By that person receiving Jesus, other people can receive the Lord, the people that they have in contact with. And so, Father, may we see, again, the time is short and be about your business. We thank you for your anointing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise God. We are dismissed.